Welcome back to the homestead. We are standing in front of the powerhouse. Do you guys remember the powerhouse? I haven't talked about it that much because I've been busy building mom's place. But this is uh, new to us in case you're new around here. And this is my buddy, Dr. Leo. But uh, this building right here houses all the solar power that we use now uh, because, you know, if you've been hanging around us for a while, we used a hundred year old ice box off grid and we, we brought ice in and put it in a box and just like they did in the old days. And then we moved up to a little something different and now instead of having our freezer at a neighbor's house we actually have it here and it's all run by the power of the sun so we're going to get into some of those videos coming up but today when you see dr leo it's all about the bees so this is our friend dr leo he is a natural beekeeper and he's going to give you a little information yeah thank you uh, <laughs> i live in the ozarks in southern missouri i have a website horizontalhive.com that gives you free plans and free advice and lots of information on getting started with uh, natural beekeeping and keeping bees with a smile. And uh, Doug and I have known each other for years and yeah, uh, no, I've yeah. been coming and uh, watching his progression as a beekeeper for a few years now. Yeah. But I promise you, if you watched any of the preceding uh, episodes, sir, uh, that Doug has no idea, and you have no idea, what I'm going to do with his hives today. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, I talked to him a little bit ago because we were trying to ramp this up, see about uh, you know opening up the hives for you guys so you could see how they overwintered. And I saw a little bit of movement with all three hives. Everything looks great. So I called them up and we've been trying to time the weather. And as you can tell, I'm squinting so hard. The weather's beautiful today. It's like 70s, barely any wind. There's big sun out here. And so now we're gonna rawly go over. I haven't given him any updates or anything. And he's got something for me. I don't know what's going on. So this is gonna be a lot of fun <laughs> video right here. So we're gonna walk over to the, we're gonna start off in the woods, okay? And uh, we're gonna open that hive up. And if you guys remember, if you weren't here, we actually put our bees to bed with pillows yes right that's first time I've ever done that so we're gonna open them up see how the pillows fared over winter and if any of this uh, helped and if it did or didn't why or why not so don't go anywhere and uh, we're going to the trees right now <laughs> When I come to the beehive, I start my smoker and most of the time I don't really need to give bees a lot of smoke, but I have no problem with giving them a puff of smoke if I have to, because I know that it distracts them from me opening the hive and it's actually much less disturbance for them to receive a puff of smoke than you trying to be gentle and not wanting to smoke the bees and causing all the release of pheromones or alarm pheromones on their part. In nature, the only time a hive could be open pretty much is when a bear breaks inside or when the tree collapses and opens up. So bees always react to it as a big calamity. So uh, the smell of smoke uh, tells them that there may be wildfire and just as us would not be paying as much attention to a burglar if the whole house is are on fire the bees start preparing to going inside the cavity deep inside the cavity gorging themselves on honey to just face the emergency of potential wildfire And to get some good smoke from your smoker, you need two th or three things, actually. You need their uh, fuel, and I'm not really particular about what I put in uh, the smoker. The dry leaves we have right here under our feet work just fine. You certainly do not need to buy something, something special for your smoker fuel. Um, so you need there to have uh, oxygen. This is why the smokers we use today uh, have bellows and finally you need to have a uh, high temperature uh, many times the smoker uh, doesn't start properly just because you don't let it go up to sufficient temperature here in the can to maintain the smoldering 
So when you burn the first sheet of paper, just wait a minute, let the can warm up and then you'll be able to produce as much smoke as you need uh, for your hive inspection. If you have children, especially if you have a boy, uh, lighting a smoker may turn them on to beekeeping better than honey. Uh, I remember when my uh, son was very little, this was his favorite toy. And he would be running around playing in a steam engine. So we had more smoke from him playing around the homestead than from me visiting the beehives. I have very good memories of that. It's those family stories, you know, this uh, homesteading is not just about things that we're doing and the processes that we go through. It's about making those memories and passing this knowledge down from generation to generation. And that's one of our goals here because we kind of got skipped. I mean, I didn't learn any of this knowledge from my parents or their parents. So we're just trying to bring this back around so everybody can kind of get this knowledge. I know a lot more people are keeping bees these days. So now we're going to open this up. We haven't seen what's going on in here at all. I will say this one thing. It got a little warm, you know, so I opened uh -huh. up the front. I wanted to make sure they can come in and out and did everything. And there was activity here, so let's see, see how they did over winter with their pillow. Yeah, very good. And uh, this was a fairly cold winter, was it? Oh, man, we had minus 25 degrees for two weeks straight, pretty much. It was like 20, 25 below zero, zero. Uh, you guys have been following along. We've been talking about it for a little while, so. Huh. We had a very challenging winter, not as far as snow, but definitely as far as temperatures. And you know, that's why I love these horizontal insulated hives or with very deep frames. Once I switched over to them, I never have to worry about whether my bees will freeze in the winter or will have enough winter stores. Right. They're just designed to keep them warm in the winter with one and a half inches of wool all around them. Right. This is the pillow filled with wool that we put there. Uh, in the winter and the first thing I do when I open the hive I put the palms of my hands on the top bars and if they're warm it tells you that the colony is rearing brood if they're cold that means they have no brood uh, and probably they either have no queen or the colony died so I put the palms of my hand here and against my expectation they're completely cool so there is no temperature difference between the walls of the hives and the top bars. So without, without even opening the hive or looking inside, I suspect something is wrong. But then when you look closely, you notice two things. First, there is a lot of chewed up comb at the bottom of the hive and the pillow has been damaged too. What does it tell you? A mouse. Mouse in the house! Yeah and uh, sometimes it's enough to have a mouse inside the hive in the winter and to kill the colony sometimes the colony can still survive but in this case i don't think we'll find many bees in there they don't necessarily eat the bees but they disturb them enough in the middle of the winter that the bees become agitated through so all the activity of the mice going in and out and they deplete their stores and then of course the mice chew through the comb and uh, the colony perishes. The most common reason for the mice getting inside the hive is that when you leave the entrance gate open. But Doug is telling me that uh, it was uh, screened yep. and was really no way for the mouse to get into the hive through the opening. Unless, we can't tell how long he's been in there, but okay. you know, unless he just got in there after I opened it up during the warm spell and then that cooled them off enough after the cool kind of came in but I don't think so uh, well you know another question is could it could it be that the mouse was there when we closed the gate no and, the and probably not because we did the hive inspection yeah. to the, today uh, together all right all calm still some honey in there bee bread heavy frame 
and they still have some honey left in the hive. Now the mice don't actually eat the bees. No, they don't eat the bees and they don't eat honey. Right. It's so too sweet for them. They just like the comb. Exactly. They chew through things, like, right. you know, they will chew through anything, like right. insulation of your electric wires, etc. So, uh, But all I mean is I'm not seeing actually any bees actually in here. We'll see. So another full frame of honey, pretty much, mm -hmm. in, a, in a good shape, no mold. <laughs> there is the mouse. Oh, we found the mouse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what do you do when you find the mouse, Dr. Leo? Well, uh, I know that some of the viewers might not appreciate it, but if I can, I they catch it and kill it. it. <laughs> I killed the mice. Uh, I'll tell you, well, with all the cats we have, that's the first mouse I've seen in several years. All right. He's going out the front. There he goes. Up. He's fast. He's fast. Get him. Where is he? Go come back. Where's my dog at? <laughs> oh, we did open the entrance. Yeah. Ah. All right. Then jump right out of there, boy. Scared for its life. Yeah, okay. I don't see any bees inside of there. No. Uh, let me see whether there is any. All right. So, but what you have, you have very clean, nice-looking comb uh, that you can reuse in one of the other hives. So, you know, always an upside. <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, one of my good beekeeping friends is saying that he finds that there, when a quarter of the hives die in the winter. In the following year, the, the emperor becomes stronger than in the winter when none of the hives die because right. their selection takes its course. Of course, in this case, it may not be due to the bees' inferior genetics. This is the original swarm that you caught here locally. Uh, and I don't know yet how the mouse got in there. Uh, we need to check the lid and see whether it's rocking, whether there might have been enough crack there for it to go under the lid. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, as long as the entrances are closed, mm -hmm. it's uh, completely mouse proof. I didn't have a single my, uh, mouse in my hive yeah. this winter. And that's only the second no one in 10 years that I've ever seen inside mm -hmm. of a hive. So, we got that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I really want to figure out how the mouse got in there because we had the mouse guard on the gate of the hive. Mm, the entrance was not the hole it could get through. And uh, usually the mice get there uh, during the winter or late fall, but uh, mm, I don't know whether it could be that it just got there early enough this spring to cause all of this disturbance and cause the bees to leave. It could be. No, the top is not rocking. There are no cracks anywhere around. So it's absolutely impossible for the mouse to have gone through under the lid. So uh, a question, Doug, when you visited them early in the spring, uh, did you open the entrance in the fully open position? Never opened it in the fully open position. Actually, when I came for the first inspection, I just left it open uh, to the little holes so I know they could breathe. I know there was a little action going on. I wanted them to be able to come and go, but I didn't want the queen going anywhere because isn't that one of the screens is for the queen. And, uh, you know, that's when I called you and I was like, yeah, the bees are moving around. Hives are looking good. I was all excited. The pillows worked. <laughs> but it did keep that mouse warm. If the mouse was trapped there in the fall when we closed the gate, it wouldn't survive until now. It would become dehydrated and we would find the corpse of the mouse. But this little, little thing is very agile, so in good health, well fed. So apparently it was able to get in somehow. And uh, if you have any guesses how this might happen, uh, uh, please enlighten us because I have no idea. <laughs> so if you want to exclude the mice for the winter, you want to keep it in a position like that. Um, in the spring, you can start opening it, but realize that it's enough to have any crack larger than three eighths of an inch or one centimeter for the mouse to actually be able to get in. So a small crack like that may look uh, small enough for us, but mice can actually go through there. So be careful and don't open it in a position like that. 
until you know that the cold weather is over and the bees become so active that mice wouldn't venture inside the active hive for fear of being stung. So it could very well be that I'm guilty as charged. I brought, I just wanted them to be able to come and go a little easier and I opened that up. It's quite possible that that thing just jumped in there and then, you know, did its damage during this couple weeks. Like you said, there's no way that thing lasted in there 25 degrees below zero, even with a pillow. <laughs> So, yeah. oh well, man, you're living and learning all the time. Yeah, and actually, you know, most of the time the mouse guard is for the winter. Yeah. But what we are learning here that it's important to leave it on until the warm weather really sets in. Yep, and I thought we were good to go. There was some activity here, so I thought, you know, in my mind it was just strong enough to, uh, that it made it through winter, that it would be just strong enough to keep anything out. So, yep, could have and, been uh, my error. And if you don't have fancy uh, discs like that to open and close your entrance, what you can do is you can take half inch or three eighths of an inch wire mesh and just staple it with a stapler for the winter yeah. or drive two small nails or screws to hold it for the winter and remove it in the spring. Yeah. Because you are going to put another colony in here anyway yeah. later this uh, year. So I will just go ahead and proceed with my surprise. All right. Because apparently the disturbance from the mouse early in the spring was enough for them to They respond. just packed up and left. Yeah. Oh, the poor thing. Yeah. They got no home and they got cold. Uh, you never know. They might have moved into one of these hollow trees here oh. a quarter mile away and they will come back as a swarm two months from now. To be right in here. Uh, not it never happens. Box, but in your swamp trap. Yeah. And sometimes if you leave, you don't want to leave, uh, just in case you guys are new, you don't want to leave this stuff sitting around and with spring and the heat of summer coming while you wait for a new uh, hive or anything because you'll get uh, beetles in there, everything, moths, everything in there that can destroy your hive yeah. and then you'll be in a really bad way. So we're going to actually take this stuff after we go to the other hives. I'll be cleaning all this stuff up if I don't show you all. This stuff will be moved inside. Those frames will be taken care of if we don't use them over at the next stop. So just understand that. Don't leave your stuff outside. Yeah, and if there is any delay before you're able to do it, at least close the entrance to the fully closed position with some insulation. Uh, this will prevent rubber bees and their beetles from getting in and destroying the comb. And give you a little airflow so you won't yeah. get mold or mm -hmm. anything else. And there. Uh, the warmer the weather, the faster you need to act. Right. Because all of these things, like small hive beetles or wax moth, become uh, active when the temperatures go up. That's right. Yeah. So. That's right. All right, Doug, I have something special all for right. you. All right. Let's see here. Imagine that. <laughs> oh, that's nice. So I brought uh, one of the paintings that my family created. My wife, Irina. Um, took the ancient Russian design and painted it on one of our hives. And over the years, with the sun and the rain and everything, this painting got washed away and faded away. So when she was ready to repaint the hive, I told her, let's paint it on a piece of paper. Uh -huh. Then we scanned it and we printed it on a sheet of aluminum. This way I can put it on my hive and also print another copy and give it to That's Doug awesome. as a token of appreciation of his work promoting the ideas of sustainable living. Stacy! Stacy! Are you just out for a casual little walk, are you? What? Come on now, Dr. Leo got you something fancy. Oh, okay. They made a special surprise for you. Okay, let's see, I can't wait. All right, let her see it, the reveal. You gotta tell her the story. Oh, look at it. Okay, I wanna hear about it, it's gorgeous. So, uh, this is one of the original designs we painted on our hives. Okay. And when it got degraded by the sun, uh, we decided to paint it on a piece of paper. I scanned it and we printed it on aluminum. This way I can put it back on my hive to replace the older uh, drawing. Yeah. Uh, and we, give, we can give one to you to decorate your hive. Oh, I love it! Yay! It's sort of like, you know, when you um, get a ship and you christen it with a bottle of champagne? This is my christening of the beehive. I love it. <laughs> it's gorgeous. Man, I appreciate all the work that went oh, into it. Oh, it's beautiful. Fantastic. Yeah, and it's uh, a very old uh, Russian drawing with the tree of life, symbols of life, and the birds, the air, the sun, horses, 
as the symbol of the sun and the horse that takes the sun through the sky. Sure. So all of this ancient symbology. One amazing thing though, we had a group of Native Americans come to our actuary one day and they were saying, why did you put Native American drawings and the pictures on your Russian hives? Because they were recognizing the swastikas and other symbols that they were finding in their culture. Sure. And they made, you know, when you go down in history, all of these cultures throughout the world, they have some of the same symbology. And it's amazing how the ancient Russian um, paintings have some of the same symbols as you will find on Native American embroidery or pretty much anywhere in the world. All right, and it's everything from the sky, land yeah, exactly. to the sea. See, so yeah. the elements, yeah. water, fire, and air yep. coming together. Yep. And these are the symbols of the seed and the seed being sown in the field to uh, produce leaves as symbols of our new life in the spring. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Oh, I love it. It's great. Is that back in the day, you know, everyone was shipping routes. So boats would sh sail around the world and people would be get left behind. And then those people would share those customs and the things that they had and the stories would go. And there's lots of stories that some of the Native American Indians that are here uh, through tracing and everything at were, um, you know, actually from Israel and stuff like that. So there's a lot of similarities. So I will share with you some of the tips on installing artwork like that on your beehives. Again, if you want to produce something lasting, I would recommend uh, making your design and scanning it and then printing it. Uh, any place that prints outdoor signs uh, will print from your design or uh, on a piece of aluminum that is very long lasting. After 10 years, when this paint is degraded, you can always replace it with a newly printed plate. Another thing that you guys might want to uh, think about too is if you have several of your beehives in the same area, what happens? So, putting designs like this uh, uh, on your hives helps bees recognize their own home reducing the drifting of bees from one hive to the other, keeping them healthier. So not only is it beautiful, it also serves the utilitarian purpose of our bees navigation when you have more than one hive. It's sort of like, you know, people live in a subdivision, some people have a green roof, some people have a blue <laughs> roof, they'll know which one theirs is <laughs> by their design. So that's... See, I thought she'd get a kick out of that. Bye, honey! I love it! I love it! Thank you, thank you! Bye! <laughs> <sighs> Uh, all right, now we're going to show you guys how to install it, how you can beautify your beehives. Bet you didn't know your bees were such fine uh, connoisseurs of artisan artifacts. <laughs> they are. I keep telling people that bees that live in nice looking beehives, they make uh, better honey. Yeah, it's like the happy cows. They make the best milk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what we need to do, we need to remove these entrance gates. And we'll remove these protective uh, angles. So if you paint your design on the box, or, uh, just use exterior grade acrylic paint. And uh, then you don't have to worry about having to drill the entrances through your plate. But then eventually your design after five years will start to fade and the sun rays will eventually destroy it. So uh, one of the most challenging parts of installing uh, a painting that's printed on aluminum is making neat holes over the entrances uh, without ripping up the aluminum. Uh, the hole saw is the tool used for this purpose and I will show you a very simple trick of how to make a razor sharp hole without destroying any of the aluminum around. Of course, the first thing you need to do is to measure the placement of these entrance holes and then put the center marks on this painting. But if you were to start drilling like that, what will happen is that the very thin sheet of aluminum will be caught on these uh, uh, tines and uh, on the teeth of the saw and it will start ripping through them. So it will be all torn rather than cut. So the trick that allows you to make a very sharp uh, hole is to take two pieces of plywood, put one behind and one in front and clamp them together and then drill through the plywood and then through the uh, painting, the aluminum, and then through another layer of plywood. Because it's clamped, 
it really cuts through it without tearing the aluminum apart. When you do that, do not assume that all of the holes are exactly the same distance from the bottom because when you build it, it can be off by a quarter inch. Um, so always measure each one from the bottom and from that edge. All right, so. So five and three, one and The most precise are cut. You first need to drill a small 3 32nd of an inch pilot hole where the center of the holes will be. So you mark it on the aluminum and then with a 3 32nd bead or so you drill right through it. And you do all three pilot holes. I change this to the uh, hole saw. This is one and three quarter inch diameter. These openings are one and a half inch and it gives you a perimeter of one eighth of an inch on all sides or as a margin of error. Okay, so what we do here is uh, it's best to have a hole saw with the pilot bit that sticks out a lot, like at least an inch and a half like what you see here and you will see why. So what we first do, we enlarge this pilot hull without touching the aluminum with the hull saw, just we make this uh, uh, opening larger going through. Doesn't take much effort at all. Plywood. I drill through it and now I put my pilot bit through the plywood and then I put it through the aluminum in the same hole that I already have. And now I put it through another sheet of uh, plywood that's underneath. Okay, there it went. Now we have a sandwich of two pieces of plywood with the painting between them and everything is connected with the pilot bit that's already there on the center of the hole that you need to drill. Before drilling it, you clamp it with their uh, clamp so that it doesn't shift anywhere. And then again, once you start drilling, what will happen is that when the hole saw penetrates the plywood and touches the aluminum, all the surrounding plywood will still be intact, holding the aluminum and preventing the tears all around. See, we tricked you guys. You thought we were gonna go through that hole. It's a new hole. This was from the last one that he did. This new is one. a new one. Ha ha! Gotta stay on your toes around here. All right, so uh, I'm ready to go. Um, the best results are when you go at maximal speed but minimum pressure. Preferably use the corded saw, but since we're here off grade, I'm using the battery power tool. See, no damage to the surrounding artwork just a very very sharp incision and in the aluminum. Very very clean cut with the basic hull saw that you can pick up for 10 bucks at any uh, home improvement store. Um, the brand doesn't really matter. The technique is what allows you to make this very very precise cut. So we're repeating the same thing with two more hulls and then we'll be ready to install it on the face of your hive. I love right. that thing. So and now the moment of truth where I measured right. I got a pretty good sneaky feeling you've done it before. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there you go. Now we have to attach it. 
So I guess it wouldn't matter if the bees were in there or not in there, you'll be able to do this process either way, right? Uh, correct. I actually do it all the time when I need to replace the old degraded design with the new one that we printed. I just come to the hive and all it takes is putting it over the entrance. So it's a disturbance of one second and the bees don't really mind. They continue coming and going as if nothing had happened. So the installation process is twofold. You need to apply a bit of silicone all around to seal it around the edges so that uh, small hive beetles or all kinds of vermin etc cannot get behind the painting between the wall of the hive and the painting and make themselves a cozy home there. So you just apply a bit of silicone, you press it into the silicone and then you attach it uh, with the same angles that we took off on the corners and this completes the installation. So there's actually no drilling into the hive at all? No, no uh, other than these three are there. And it also preserves the uh, integrity of the artwork. Yes. Uh, the silicone you use is just the regular household 100% silicone. Um, two ounce, 2.8 ounce or two will make one or two hives. But make sure this is the silicone sealant that we put around sinks and tubs. Do not use silicone adhesive because silicone glue is much, much stronger. If you were to glue it to the hive, you would never ever be able to take this off without destroying the plywood underneath. The attachment is just too strong. This provides enough bonding to set it there and to seal the perimeter so nothing can get behind there. But if you ever need to replace it after 10 years when the colors start fading eventually, uh, then you are able to remove it and put a new one. So use silicone sealant, not silicone adhesive. And I put it about a quarter inch from the edge. When you start pressing on it, it will spread and come out of the seam about uh, 3 16 of an inch or a quarter inch bead, good bead. And uh, just go all around the front wall of the hive. Part of the desire to make the hives look beautiful is just bringing out all of the significance of beekeeping of something that lets you get out of the rat race and just stop and admire something beautiful. Even Winnie the Pooh was saying that honey is not the best thing in the world. If you read the Winnie the Pooh book, remember what it was? That was the most exquisite thing in the world for Winnie the Pooh? It was the anticipation of eating honey. The same thing for me about bees. It's not just honey or livelihood. It's just the beauty of being there in nature. Silence, the buzzing of bees, the fragrance of flowers around and just feeling part of this universal flow of life that flows through us, through you, through me, and also flows through the bees. And you know, I feel that this is the dimension of our, this uh, more than human dimension that's missing from much on conventional beekeeping, because when all of the apiaries and the hives are just utilitarian, they are white boxes with peeling paint, they are being handled by forklifts. Yes, it works. And many beekeepers are, make a living, support their families, are, and they have thriving businesses through it. But for me, something is not there. When the hives are painted beautifully and decorated like that, then I feel, yeah, this is the feeling of rightness. This is what beekeeping represents for me. So I guess this is an outwardly expression of the inwardly quest for meaning and beauty and uh, everything that we value in life. Don't, don't just press too hard because the point is to create a seal. If you were to press so hard, like use clamps, you, what you will do, you will squeeze out so much silicone that it will actually make the bond uh, weaker. So when you feel that it's there, all around, around the entrances, around the edges. That's good enough. Uh, normally, of course, I do it to a hive in a horizontal position. I put it on its side and then I put weights here, like heavy books, overnight until the uh, silicone solidifies. 
but if you do it in the field on the active hive or like we're doing it here what you can do is use the same clamps for holding this uh, artwork in place while you're completing the installation by driving the screws in the corner see I'm not holding it anymore and just the bond of silicone is enough to hold it pretty much in place. Uh, aluminum, like any metal, is very sharp on the edge. So when you're installing the panel, make sure it does not stick down beyond the edge of the wood. This way, if you ever have to lift it, you are grabbing by the wood instead of it protruding and you can cut your finger if uh, the panel was to sit lower than uh, uh, the wood underneath. Another thing that would happen if you ever have to transport the hive or shift it on a support, it would catch this aluminum and damage the edge. So make sure it's either flush or slightly above the edge of the front wall. Look at that, they love it already. <laughs> the bees are hardy coming in. <laughs> hey little fella. Oh man, hotel's closed. I just position it over the edge. Again, the same applies to the angles. Make sure they do not stick down beyond the wall because otherwise you can cut your finger on it. Feeling necessary. One more tip about the entrances, you have two options. One, you can reinstall the same discs that you took off and then you'll be able to rotate them and change position from open to ventilation to closed. Uh, but realize that this disc will be uh, scraping uh, and scratching the uh, artwork and degrading it more quickly. And also there will be these three big discs that are detracting from uh, the beauty of the artwork. So if you want to keep it as uh, pristine without uh, this being in the place of you admiring the artwork, what I suggest is using just cork. Uh, and this is called number 20 cork stopper. And it's the right size to fit into these entrances. So the ones that you don't use, you just put the cork in. And this is what the keepers were doing uh, uh, for centuries uh, before entrances like that became available. So today, because the hive is empty, we are putting this one in too. But uh, normally we would have two of them plugged up, uh, read, keeping bees with a smile and uh, keeping bees in horizontal hives uh, for description of how the two other entrances are being used. But uh, normally only one is open and two are plugged up and only used on special occasions like putting two uh, columns in the same box. Okay, so I get it, uh, like we're talking about what you just said, but what happens now when I'm rolling into fall and winter, the, that's not going to give any oxygen, like you leave those open so it can breathe or whatever, I mean, yeah. there's no problem so there. If you are using the uh, cork stopper in the winter, you would remove it and you would put a piece of uh, wire mesh oh, there I see. to let oxygen in but prevent mice from getting in. So would you adhere it on here with some silicone? Would you that could, be good enough? Or? You could just you know a few drops of silicone or actually you can make it so that it fits into the opening. Oh I see. Almost like uh, the strainer on on the bottom of the sink right. in the kitchen. Okay very good. I just yeah. wanted to make sure in case yeah. you guys try the cork that you know they have to breathe in there too so. Yeah good and stuff. you know when hives are like that I just come to the apiary yeah. and for me I don't need to go on a beach vacation anymore because when I have a free moment I just come and I sit there I watch the bees and this beautiful painting created by my wife Irina uh, for me complete Thanks, picture. and by the way I have a surprise for you too if you like this particular design we can make copies for you too and you can order them on horizontalhive.com wow good stuff I guess now we're gonna we moved them on up and beautified them over here. So now we're gonna inspect the other two out in the pasture. We have a couple of stories that I'm gonna tell you guys about what happened to those over the winter time. Oh my. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, we're just getting this started. So don't go anywhere. Here we go. Okay, now I know I said we were going over to the other hives, but this is actually the next morning. 
all right guys so real quick i wonder why more beekeepers don't talk about beautifying their hives okay it's also great for me to look at but like dr leo was explaining to you bees also if you have an apiary with a lot of beehives in them it helps them to distinguish which beehive is theirs when they come back in from their foraging flights okay so i think that's pretty important that if you have a large apiary with five or ten or four or 12 uh, beehives in them especially with the verticals and they're usually all white um, you know one thing you can do is you can paint your beehives and he talked to you about the type of paint to use to differentiate them and help the bees figure out which beehive is theirs when they come back now another thing that you can do is you could turn each entrance a different way okay so if you have like five uh, vertical hives in your apiary you could turn one hive this way one hive this way see what i mean one hive this way that also helps with the bees returning home so i'm wondering why more beekeepers don't talk about beautifying their hives to help the bees land in the right beehive so maybe this will help get the word out there but at least you guys learned something new today but the video was going to be really long so i decided this would be a great spot to finish the video uh, dr leo brought these this beautiful print out for us total surprise um, i had no idea he was even working on such a project so all these prints are available at his website horizontalhive.com we're just going to leave it right here for right now uh, what we learned about this hive today what we learned was the hive wasn't strong enough because <laughs> actually if I would have opened that up which I did um, and the hive was strong enough the mouse would have never went in there anyways um, so it was just kind of a weak hive to begin with not sure what was going on with that it looked pretty good going into winter time um, this was a smaller box if you guys remember when we put these in here uh, that it wasn't even halfway so they didn't really have much time to build out last year or anything so it's just kind of how it goes. What we'll do is we'll set out some swarm traps and then we'll catch some more bees this year. And then Dr. Leo will be coming all the rest of the summer and walking us through all the processes. And it's really nice that he takes his time out to come up here and help educate you guys on beekeeping. And also it's teaching me new things, um, you know, different approaches to beekeeping that I hadn't tried before. And I've been beekeeping now for, this is my eighth year, so. And we use the honey here for all of our sweeteners, um, you know, in our chocolate tea. And also, uh, you know, for the pollinators is why we like the bees. We put flowers out and everything. And without the bees and uh, the other pollinators, we wouldn't have any food, basically. So we just got to make sure that they have nice, safe homes and that we look after them the best we can. Okay. And if you make a mistake out there, just remember that you'll be able to correct it. And this whole thing is a learning experience. All right. So what I'm going to do now is uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. <laughs> and uh, this is the most beautiful. I'm going to get that other part of this video together for you tomorrow so we got back-to-back -back bee videos and then uh, Gary and Marge are coming up we're gonna be working on the log cabin so this week should be full of great uh, entertainment for you guys a lot of good knowledge and a lot of that good old uh, off-grid with Doug and Stacy living so hey thanks for stopping by the homestead and uh, I hope you guys are enjoying these bee videos really do horizontalhive.com see you guys tomorrow on the next bee video where we're gonna go over there we're gonna actually break apart the whole horizontal hive, put it inside of one of these, and also do an inspection on the other hive, uh, just like this with the pillow, and see how it did. So make sure you're here tomorrow morning, and we'll see you guys later. And have a great day today. Get outside. I haven't been up in Lever City. I've been praying on some simple Midwest living homestead instead of my own. Nine to five with a suit and tie going